Hi, my name is Mike Callahan. I'm a STEM educator and welcome to Programming on Purpose with Python. Number two, this is where we will develop a graphical user interface or commonly called a GUI for the discount calculator that we developed in the previous slides. Using Python, we are going to design a graphical user interface, commonly called a GUI, Discount Calculator, which will run on any platform with Python and a library called TK Intertoy installed. Here's where we're going to learn about GUI design and something called event-driven programming. Now, I know we're asking a lot out of an hour, but we're only going to be concentrating on the parts that we need for this particular task. Like I said, this will get us started in the right direction of the wonderful world of GUI design. And in the end, we'll talk about further educational options. Now, most of the time when you learn a new computer programming language, you learn a little piece of the language, and then you're given examples on how you can explore how these pieces operate. But here we're going to turn things around a little bit. We're going to be focused on developing a single application. And as we need them, we're going to introduce the parts of Python that we'll need to accomplish our task. So the application development and the learning of Python will occur at the same time. Now, normally, you don't get into GUI interfaces when you're first starting to learn how to use a programming language. But because of we're going to need it pretty quickly, we're going to get into a graphical user interface design a lot earlier than you would expect. Now, this actually is going to make programming more fun. And you'll see why a little bit later. In order to go through these slides, you're going to have to install some software on your machine. First, you need Python 3, the latest version. So just go to www.python.org and download that and install it for your particular platform. Now, you should also get something called Idle and the TK Enter library. So we're going to check to make sure that that happened. After you install Python, go to your Start menu and bring up idle. It should be under the Python group. And then you'll see something that pops up, which we will call the shell window. And there's little three greater than signs. That's called a prompt. In that prompt, I want you to type the word import and then a space and the word TK enter and then hit enter. Hopefully, you will see another prompt pop up right underneath it, and that means you're good to go. If you start seeing error messages, then you're going to have to go online and read how to fix TK Enter. So let's assume that TK Enter is there. So now you have to download and install a library that I wrote called TK Enter Toy. For Windows people, you have to right click on the start window and select Windows PowerShell Admin. For you other platforms, just get to the command line. In either case, for the Windows people, type in py-m, then pip, P-I-P, -P, install, and then T-K-I-N-T-E-R, T-O-Y, TK Enter Toy, and hit Enter. You should see a lot of things happen, but hopefully at the very bottom it'll say TK Enter Toy was installed. If you get error messages saying that you don't have the right permissions to do this, then try another line, PY, space, minus M, space, PIP, space, install, space, dash, user, space, PK Enter Toy, 
And this will do the same thing, except it will just install it just in the user directory. So if both of these fail, then you're going to have to go online and read how to fix PIP. You won't be able to do anything on the later set of slides unless TK Intertoy is installed. By the way, PIP uses a website called pypi.org, pypi.org. And that's where you get the libraries. Now, Tinkertoy should work anywhere Python 3 and TK Enter are installed. And it has been tested on Windows and Linux. You can also install Python 3 on Android devices. So all you have to do is go to the Play Store and look for PYDroid3 from IIEC. Now this package is complete. It also includes TKEnter and PIP. So to get Tinkertoy on your device, all you have to do is go to the menu, bring up PIP, and just search for TKINTER toy, and then click on install and it will take care of it for you. The editor that comes with PYDroid 3 is not idle, but it's actually a more advanced editor. Now, most, like most free Android apps, you will see ads anytime you run a file. So this can get pretty irritating. So in order to remove the ads and also to get a better system, it costs $10, and it's well worth it if you're going to do any work on Android. Now, I don't recommend typing code on a cell phone. Um, it's pretty difficult. But if you have a tablet, this might be a good way of learning how to do uh, programming. There might be other Pythons for Android, but this is the only one I could find that works with Tinkertoy. Let's cover some conventions that will be used in these slides. Code will be in a monospaced text. It will look like a typewriter text. And any new code that is on the screen will be highlighted in yellow. Something called objects will be in a bold, rounded text. And any new words that we introduce will be in italics. For this slideshow, we're going to look at GUI design. Then we're going to see how to assemble the functions that we've written into an application. And then finally, for Windows users, we're going to show you how to create a shortcut so you can access your application. So our tasks, first of all, we have to design the GUI for our calculator. And then we'll have to connect the GUI to the actions of the calculator. Now, one of the advantages Python has on other programming languages, Python is truly an interactive, interpreted language. And what that means is basically, you can type anything on what's called a prompt, and Python will do it right before your very eyes. And I believe that really there is no better way to learn about a programming language than an interactive interpreted language. So we're going to first uh, bring up Python. Uh, I don't know exactly what platform you're working with, but hopefully you have Python 3.7 or later installed. And I want you to bring up the thing that's called idle. Idle is what we call a development uh, platform. And it's included in almost every Python installation. So hopefully you have idle on your system. Now it's pretty primitive. And uh, it basically contains something called a shell. 
and an editor. Now, certainly Idle is not uh, the best development system available, but I think for beginners, it's going to work for our purpose. And uh, there are better systems out there, but sometimes uh, for a beginner, the, the more useful systems might be a little too complex. So I, again, I believe idle is a good first step. And like I said, no matter what platform you're, you're dealing with, hopefully idle will be there. Okay, our function works, but there's no way we could expect our user to get into idle and type all that nonsense. So we have to develop a modern interface. And today, everybody expects what's called a graphical user interface, or commonly referred to as a GUI. So writing GUIs can be a bit tricky. But because of that, I developed a library that makes it easy to have simple GUIs. I called it TinkerToy because it's based on a standard library in Python that is should be called TKEnter, but commonly mispronounced Tinker. Tinker is based on something called TK. And I believe that stands for Toolkit. And this was the first easier to use library for making GUIs. And it was based on a language we call TCL, or again, pronounced Tickle. And it stands for Tool Control Language. Tickle had its day in the sun, but it's hardly used anymore. But because TK, was so popular, a lot of languages have interfaces to TK, and that keeps Tickle alive. For a Windows installation, Tickle and TK are included with Python. I think it's also included with Mac versions, and hopefully Tickle and TK are already in a Linux installation. So again, Tinker, is a Python interface to TK, and a, a newer version of that is called TTK. And while all this sounds complicated, that's what Tinkertoy does. It hides the complexity. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes, here is the structure of all the libraries that are being called whenever you make a Tinkertoy call. Tinker Toy will call Tinker. Tinker will call TK and TTK. Those will call Tickle. And finally, Tickle will call the operating system functions and make it happen. So now we're going to learn how to design a GUI. Let's learn the basics of GUI design. First of all, GUIs are contained in a window. The window will have a title, and the things inside the window are commonly called widgets. We have two different types of widgets here, an entry widget, and that's where the user would type in some sort of information, and a label widget is where the program will actually display some information that the user cannot overwrite. Also at the bottom, you have two command buttons, and these are what the user clicks on when he wants something to happen. Let's review what you just learned. Again, the window is the most important part because that's what everything is in. The window contains the entire application, and all the widgets will be inside a window. The title of the window is very important as well. This lets the user know he started the correct application. In Tinkertoy, if you don't give it a title, it will assume a title of TK, it's the way it's designed. So I would always encourage you to give it some sort of title. Widgets are an object that holds some part of the interface, 
And widgets have a specific purpose. The point of the widget is to limit the user into making a correct input. Our three examples here were the entry widget. That's where the user types in something. It's also important to note that all the entries will be interpreted as strings, even numerical values that you type in. The label widget is where the application will place a string into a box and the user cannot access this box. And the button, that's what the user clicks on to make something happen. And buttons are connected to either functions or methods. Tinkertoy was designed to be simple and it was intended for beginning programmers so they can go quickly into the world of graphical user interfaces. All the GUI creation code should be contained in a separate function or a class. And we haven't talked about classes yet, but in other slideshows we will. This is very important because the design of the GUI will be independent of the underlying function. So you can kind of change the way the GUI looks and not have to worry about the rest of the code. The steps are very straightforward. First, you create a window, and that's going to contain all your widgets. The window has to be given a name, and usually I use GUI. The window is given a title and again if you don't do this step your title will be TK and I don't think that's going to do your users any good whatsoever. Then you write the code to create the desired widgets. Then the widgets are placed in the window and maybe positioned and stretched in various ways. And finally the function will return the GUI variable, and that's going to be used by other functions. Well, we've talked about functions, but another powerful part of Python is objects can have methods. Now, methods kind of look like functions, but methods are attached or bound to their object with a period. So here's some simple code. I have created a string which has my name in it. And we are going to call the upper method to the string. And you can see that returns a new string with my name capitalized. Another example is we have called a method, the index method, and we're looking for the letter I. So what it's going to do is it's going to return a 1. Remember, we count from 0, so it finds the i in position 1. To create a widget in TK Intertoy, you call the add widget method of the GUI window. And you have to have something called a tag. And most of the time, you will have something called a frame title. Now, the tag will be a key for the widget that is in the GUI's.contents dictionary. And because of this, all widgets must have a tag. The tag can be any string, but of course it makes sense to use a string that tells the purpose of that widget. Now, the frame title will be the text on the widget frame, and that's going to act as a prompt for the user. Not all widgets have frames or titles. So let's look at an example. We have our window GUI, and we're going to use the add entry method. So it's GUI dot add entry. And our two arguments are initial, which will be our tag. And then our prompt is going to be initial price. And you can see the results on the right. Now, once this widget has been created, we can get the contents of the widget by using the get method for the GUI window with the tag that we use to create the widget. 
So for example, all we have to do is say we.get initial and we'll stick that into a variable called value. To place strings in the widget, we use the set method for the GUI window. So in this example, GUI.set, initial, and then a comma, and then the value you want to stick in there. Notice that we only have to worry about the GUI window. This makes interfaces simpler. So after we create the widget, in order to make it appear, we must plot it. Plotting requires the tag. And then usually we want to specify a row and a column, which default to zero. It's very important to use the same tag that you used when you created it. Now there's lots of optional parameters, which we will discuss later. And you can see the code looks a little bit different from what we've seen in other examples. You see GUI.plot and then the required argument, which is the tag, again, the string initial, then a comma. And now you see an example of an optional parameter, row equals zero. The optional parameters will be labeled in this way. And you specify the optional parameters that you need. In this example, we're going to place our widget in the first row because you start counting at zero. Keyword parameters for functions and methods is a really nice feature of Python. In our case, the only required parameter for plot is the tag. But there are lots of different optional parameters. And just think of the difficulty if you had to supply all those optional parameters and remember the order of those parameters. Not only would the task be very difficult, the code would be very ugly. So Python makes this easy by using keyword parameters. After the required tag parameter is listed, then the programmer only needs to supply the optional parameters that they need by supplying the keywords. The ones they don't supply will have defaults. And the order of the keyword parameter is not important. That is very useful. So here's an example of another widget that we're plotting. GUI.plot. The tag is commands. And we've just used two optional parameters, the row. Remember, row equals five means that's going to be the sixth row. And then something called pad Y, which is the vertical spacing. And we're going to have a vertical spacing of 10 pixels. Enough talking. Let's write some more code. I want you to open up DiscCalc. And we're going to add some lines near the top. Skip that first line that tells the name of the file. Go under a line or two. And then type this phrase from tkintertoy import window. Window is a special object that has a lot of stuff connected with it. And that's really all you need to take advantage of tkintertoy. It's just importing window. So now we're going to create our first GUI function. And we're going to call it make GUI. And just like we did in the past, you start out with def. And you have make GUI and an empty argument list and then the colon. Again, don't forget that colon. Then we have some documentation of what the method is, or sorry, what the function is going to do. So here's our steps. The first line is we're going to create a window just by calling 
the window object with an empty argument list and we're going to stick that into our new variable called GUI. And we're going to title the window by using GUI.setTitle and we're just going to call it my first GUI. Then we're going to add one widget to the window. That's GUI.add button. And we're going to give it the tag command. Next, we're going to plot that button, or button row actually. And uh, we're just going to stick it in column zero, row zero, and uh, that are the default arguments. So all we have to do is say plot the same tag. And then we're going to return GUI. Again, remember the idle editor does not have auto save, so be sure you save your edits frequently. In the same file near the bottom, you can erase those print lines that tested our function. And now we're going to add two lines, again near the bottom that is going to activate the GUI. So we have to call the function that creates the GUI and that simply will be GUI equals make GUI empty argument list. Notice that above it the function is indented in the definition part but when you call the function that is not indented. So that's going to make the GUI but now we have to tell the computer, wait for the user to do something. And that is very simply GUI dot wait for user. Notice user is capitalized, empty argument list. That is called an event loop. And we're going to look at how that works on the next slide. Okay, let's look at that uh, magic piece of uh, code there, uh, the method wait for user. Let's talk about something called event driven programming. Now, if you're an old style programmer, like I used to be, uh, you wrote things and what was called procedure driven, where if you do this step, then you do this step, then you do this step. Well, unfortunately, with uh, GUIs, there is no way you can tell what order the user is going to do. Uh, he might click on a uh, entry box, type something in. He may click on a button. You have no clue of how he's going to do it and what order he's going to do it. So the application has to be written to respond to whatever the user does when he does it. Uh, these things are called events. So some very simple events in this example is if the user moves the mouse, then that mouse pointer has to follow it on the, on the screen. Uh, so you wiggle the mouse, that mouse pointer has to move. If the user clicks on an entry widget, then you have to make the input cursor blink inside that widget. If the user presses uh, a key, then the value that's on that key will have to appear inside that entry widget and so on and so forth. There's all kinds of stuff that can happen uh, while that GUI is, is running. The nice thing about it is a Tinker Toy takes care of all those details for you bundled into that wait for user. So the programmer doesn't need to worry about all this stuff, just needs to be aware that a lot of things are happening in the background with all these events. And we call that an event processing loop. So here is our design for our discount calculator. Um, so you know that we're going to need three entry widgets for the user to type in the initial price, the sale discount, and the, the coupon discount. We're going to need two label widgets where the program will show the final price and the total discount. And we need that uh, button row widget that we had created earlier. Uh, so we're going to just keep things simple. 
and stack everything up in a single column. So here is our grid. Um, this is very simple. Again, since we have everything in a single column, uh, column is going to be column zero. And remember, if you don't type in a column parameter, that um, will always assume zero. So everything's going to stack up. So row zero will be the initial price. Row one will be the sale discount. Uh, row two will be the coupon discount. Row three is going to be the final price, row four, the total discount, and row five will be your command buttons. Notice for our new make GUI, we've already written the first two lines. GUI.window will be the same. The set title, though, let's change it from my first GUI to uh, discount. The next three lines are where we add our entry using the add entry method of GUI. And the tag for the first one is going to be initial. And the frame title will be initial price. The second one will be sale and sale discount. And the third one will be coupon and coupon discount. For the label widgets, we're going to use GUI.addLabel. The tag will be final. Frame title will be final price. The other one will be total with the frame title of total discount. And the add button, very similar to what we saw before. And notice there is no frame title for add button. So we've created our widgets. Now we need to place them in the window using the plot method. One thing I like to do is include all my plot methods in the same section of code. Other programmers may want to create the widget and then plot it. It's personal preference, but I find if you put all the plot statements together, it makes it a little bit easier to play with the interface. So the only optional arguments we're using for the Entry and the label widgets is the row number. The command line buttons, we have two optional arguments, the row number and pad Y. Remember that is the vertical spacing. I wanted to have a little bit of spacing between the entry and label widgets and those command buttons. And the last line, very important, return GUI. That's so other functions can take advantage of this GUI. So let's step back and look at the make GUI function. First thing is we assign GUI, that window object that we imported from TK Enter Toy, and we set the title. We add in the three entry widgets we need. We add in the two label widgets we need, we add in the button row, we plot everything, and we return the GUI object so the next function can take advantage. So now we run our application and we can look at the appearance of the GUI and it looks like what we expect. Notice I had to make the window a little bit wider to make the complete title up here. We'll deal with that problem later. While we can look at the appearance of the GUI, of course, if we type anything in there and click on the OK button, nothing's going to happen. We still have to write that code. Hey, we haven't talked too much about buttons, but uh, we, we definitely need to talk about them now. Once the GUI is created and this application will loop until the user uh, clicks on a command button. So now if the user clicks on OK, we want to make sure that we get the contents of the initial sale, the initial, the sale, and the coupon entry widgets, uh, call double discount, and then place the results of that into the final and the total widgets. 
Now, if the user clicks on cancel, we don't want anything to happen and we want to close the application. It's time to learn a little more Python. We're going to learn how to do a decision. In Python, like most things, it's very simple. You just say, if some condition, and the condition has to be able to be evaluated to true or false, then you indent four spaces, and you have a block of code. Then you also have an optional is else condition, and you can stack as many of those up as you want. And then finally, you have another optional if else, which is kind of a default, more code. Again, Python marks blocks of codes with indentation. There's no curly Q brackets, no begin ending statements, or anything like that. The standard indenting is four spaces, and it's not wise to use tabs, especially if you move to different editors. And the one thing you're probably going to forget is that colon. So remember, each if if else and else line must end in a colon. Now it's time to learn about conditional loops. In Python, it is just simply while then some condition, the colon, your block of code, and you also have an else option if you want to use it. Now you can break loops simply by using the break statement and you can continue a loop by using the continue statement. What continue does is it short circuits the rest of the block of that code and jumps right back up to the condition. The else part, if the loop exits normally with no breaks, then the else part will execute. So here's what we're going to do. This is kind of an infinite loop. So we're going to say while true, and notice true is capitalized because it's a special word in Python. And there's that colon. So this is going to be always true. So this loop is going to run forever. So we have our code indented, do something. And then we're going to have our conditional statement in the middle of the loop, if some condition, colon, and then break. That's going to break out of the loop. And again, notice break is indented to levels because it is a part of the if statement. Now we introduced true and false. Turns out that is part of a section of Python that's called a Boolean variable. Now there was a mathematician named George Boole who invented this branch of mathematics that solved logic problems well before the advent of computers. But it turns out Boolean algebra is very useful for computers. So here's Python's implementation of it. A variable can be true or false. True is actually equal to 1. False is equal to 0. Notice that true and false are capitalized. All objects with a value of 0 or empty are logically interpreted as false. So a zero is false, a 0.0, .0 would also be false. An empty list, an empty tuple, an empty dictionary, an empty string, all of these things are false. None is also a special value in Python, which is also false. Everything else is considered to be true. Now, we're going to see that this is very useful and it can lead to very easy to read code. Another feature of Python we're going to take advantage of a little bit in this code is called packing and unpacking tuples. What it means is that you can assign variables in one assignment statement. So here we go, we have a tuple, and notice you can drop the parentheses. But we have a tuple, verb, preposition, value, and we're going to equal it. We're going to assign it to three values, count, string count, string of two, and the integer three. 
So we type this line in, and hit return, and then we look at verb, and it's assigned to count. Prep is assigned to two, and value is assigned to three. Another very useful thing is if you want to swap variables. In Python, you can just say a comma b equals b comma a, and it will swap the values for a and b. Now we're ready to write the code for our command buttons. So we're running GUI wait for user. We're waiting for the user to press either the OK button or the cancel button. If he presses the OK button, we can look at GUI.contents and it will be non-empty. And that will be interpreted as true. So we just say if GUI.contents colon and then the amount of code we'll have to write will be indented underneath that. Now, if the user clicked on cancel, then GUI.contents will be empty. That will be interpreted as false. So our if statement will execute the else part, the else block of code, which is just going to be break out of the loop. Just to give you an idea, of what's going on behind the scenes. This is the actual code for TK Intertoy. So if the user clicks on the OK button, that's going to execute this method called breakout. And all it does is it calls this self.master.quit, which breaks out of the loop. However, if the user clicks on cancel, notice that self dot content is emptied at this point and then the self dot master dot destroy which will completely destroy that window just for fun i printed out what a typical gui dot contents looks like and don't worry about all the details but you can see that for each widget it is a dictionary entry and it has a entry, each one has a type, a value, a frame, and a widget. And clearly, if the user would clicked on cancel, then this whole thing would have been empty. So that's how TK Intertoy knows the difference between an OK click and a cancel click. We are now ready to start working with our widgets. In order to get what the user typed in, we are going to use the get method of the window using the widget tag. Now get will always return a string and we will have to convert that string into a float in order to use it. To show the user what the result is, we will use the set method of the window, again, using the widget tag. And set will always need a string, so we will have to convert the float into a string in order to use it. Now it's time to write the code that executes when the user presses OK. So if the user does click on OK, we need to process the input data. So we're going to create a new function, which is going to be called process OK, which is going to do three things. It's going to get the data. It's going to call double discount. And it's going to put the results back into the GUI. So we need the GUI. So we're going to pass that as a parameter. And it's going to place its data directly into the GUI, so it's not going to return anything. And in Python, if a function doesn't return anything, it actually is returning something called none. So we have created our new function. And here's our first three lines. Initial equals float of GUI.get initial and then the sale and the coupon. Remember, you have to convert the string into a float, so we're going to use that 
float built-in function. Here's where we call double discount and notice double discount takes the initial the cell coupon and returns two values and we're going to unpack that tuple into final and total taking advantage of that trick I introduced earlier. Now we're going to update the GUI with our values. Final, we're going to convert it to a string and then use the GUI.set method. And then we'll do the same thing for total. And here is our entire function. Process OK. It is common practice in Python to put all the code that actually executes the steps, gets everything started into a main function. So our main function is going to be pretty simple. First we're going to create the GUI. Then we're going to start the application loop. That's that infinite loop we introduced earlier. Then we're going to start the event loop. And that's that wait for user method that we introduced earlier. And then if the user clicks on OK, we're going to process the loop with the function we just wrote. And we're going to repeat the loop. If the user clicks on something else, that's going to execute the else clause, which is going to exit the application. Now we're ready to create our main function. And notice we've already typed the first line. But we do have to indent it to make sure it's part of the main function. So just make that single indentation or spaces and you should be ready to go. And here is where we're going to start the application loop, which again is an example of an infinite loop that we introduced earlier. It's just simply while true colon and true is capitalized. Now we're going to type the GUI wait for user line. We've already typed this, so what we have to do is indent it two levels, put it under the while. Then we'll check to see if GUI.contents is empty or not. In this case, it is not, it is full. GUI.contents is true, so we're going to execute our process OK with that. GUI argument. Else, that means the user clicked on cancel, and we're all we're going to do is break out of the loop. And there is the entire main function. You can see if you've designed your application correctly, most of the time your mains are going to be fairly short. And here we are running our code. And if you still have that initialization code, you need to delete it. It's not going to hurt anything, but it's not doing anything either. So here you can see the way the application is structured. We have our line at the top that just basically documents what the file does. We have our import statement from Tinkertoy import window. And then we have the definition of double discount, make GUI, process OK, and main. And at the very bottom, you have to add a line where we actually call main and get the process started. So when you execute main, you should see your discalc pop up. And it should look like on the right. And type in any value you want to. Click on OK and see if it works. If you get an error message, that's going to show up in the shell window. And more than likely, you've mistyped uh, a function or, or maybe left out a colon or parentheses or something like that. Don't dis get discouraged. All programmers make what are called syntax errors. And it takes a while to get the hang of things. So let's see what Python actually does in this example. Now remember, Python is an interpreter, so it's going to look at everything line by line. So the first line we give it is from Tinker, uh, TK Intertoy, import window. So that's the first line it executes. 
Then it's going to do the definitions. It's going to define double discount, make GUI, process OK, and then main. Finally, at the very bottom, it executes main. So jumping back up, you can see the next step is main makes the GUI, then it starts the application loop, then it starts the event loop, waits for the user to click on either OK or cancel. The user clicks on OK, then GUI.content will be true. It will have some contents to it and it's going to execute that process OK. And if that's the next step, it'll jump back to that while loop and it'll just keep doing this until the user press clicks on cancel. It'll execute the else clause and then break out of the application. It's always a good idea to create a shortcut so you can get to your application. And this is how you do it in Windows. You right click on the screen and if you do that you'll see create a shortcut and basically just agree to all the the default values but now you're gonna have to go back in and change the properties and you want to make the target PYW and then the name of the file here I since I have to keep track of different types of uh, functions at different levels. That's why you see the, the two. Yours would just be discalc.py. And then in the start in box, that's where you type the entire path of where discalc.py lives. Uh, you don't have to type actually discalc.py, just the path to get to it, all the subdirectories. If you do that, and click on OK, you will see a strange little icon pop up. It says, uh, looks like a rocket ship, uh, maybe with a some intertwining snakes. Anyway, that's the default um, icon for EYW. Notice you can change this icon by going back into the properties and click on the Change Icon button. But anyway, this is how it works for Windows. If you have a different platform, then you're going to have different instructions. So you've typed in your first application, you've run it, and everything is fine. And you, like I said, you might want to play with things and run it again and see perhaps how the labels change. But if you look at this, it's not exactly right. One of the things is the label widgets are different sizes. Even though they're centered, they're different sizes. And that's a little strange. And everything is in a single column. We did that for simplicity. But Tinkertoy supports multi-column type GUIs. So let's see if we can design a better GUI. This is our new design for our better GUI. First of all, we're going to put all the entry widgets on the left side of the window. And we're going to put all the label widgets on the right side. And just to let the user know there's a difference between the two, we're going to draw a vertical line between the two groups. And the button widgets are going to be centered right in the middle of the window. So here's what our new design looks like. Indeed is better balanced. The user knows on the left side is where he types in his input information. The right side is where he's going to see his results. Another thing you may have noticed on the earlier versions is sometimes the title didn't show up, especially if you use the longer title. Since our window is a little bit wider now, that problem will go away. Now we're going to fix the problem with the different size labels. It turns out that add label will size the widget to hold the frame title. Add entry with defaults to 20 characters. 
you can force add label to do the same as add entry by adding in a width parameter. So here you see we have GUI add label and the tag final, the title or the uh, the frame title final price. But then we have this width parameter equals 20. So that will ensure that our labels are the same size as our entry widgets. As I said before, there are lots of optional parameters in plot. A few of them we've already seen, row and column. That defaults to zero if you don't specify it. Row span is new. That's the number of rows to have a widget stretch across. It defaults to one, but if you wanted to have a widget that was tall, you could make that a larger number. Column span we're going to use in just a minute. That works the same way, except instead of stretching across rows, it stretches across columns. Pad X is the number of pixel spaces in the horizontal around the widget frame, and pad Y is the number of pixel spaces in the vertical around the widget frame. Sticky is a little bit strange. The widget will normally go right into the center of the space that you allocate. However, you can tell it to fill the entire space, and we'll see how that works in just a minute. So here is our new grid for our new design. So we can see we have two columns, or actually three columns. We have a column zero, which will contain the entry widgets. Column one, which will have that skinny line, and column two will have the label widgets. And now instead of uh, five rows, we only have uh, four rows, or actually uh, instead of six rows, we have four rows. But row uh, zero will be the initial price and the final price. Uh, row one will be the sale discount and the total discount. Row two will have the coupon discount all by itself, and row three will have the buttons. Okay, we're going to start with our new function, our new make GUI. And uh, you can see that the first uh, five lines uh, don't need to be changed at all. Now we're going to add our new vertical line. And you can see it's just GUI.addLine. And uh, I used the tag as SEP, short for separator. And here's an option. We want this to be a vertical line. Add line normally is a horizontal line, so this forces it to be a vertical line. Here's where we fix the problem with the width of the label widgets, just like the uh, old code, except for we add width equals 20 on both of them. And of course, we have to have the add button commands line, but that hasn't changed. So here is our new plot section. And you can see it's a little more complex than what we had before. Uh, we're specifying the row and column every time. And again, if you don't specify that, it will default to zero. But I kind of use this as a way of documenting exactly where I want all the widgets to go. There you see the pad X, we're spacing things horizontally in that two column uh, design. Uh, that way the widget isn't on top of the line. And the line is quite interesting. You can see uh, GUI.plot, SEP, row, zero, column one, and row span. So that line's going to stretch three rows. And there's that sticky. Normally what would happen is it would stretch three rows, but it would still be a small line right in the middle of those three lows, rows. Sticky north-south will make it extend the entire height of that uh, area that it reserved. 
and then a pad X of five pixel spaces. The other things are pretty similar, except for the command. We're going to look at row five, column span three. So that's going to place the row buttons uh, right in the middle of the window. But we're not stretching it out. We want those buttons to be kind of near the center and with a pad, uh, pad Y of 10 pixels. And finally, we return the GUI. Let's look at the parameters for line once more. Row and column tells you where the line's going to begin, so it's going to begin row zero, column one. Row span is going to stretch three rows, the sticky north, south, and we abbreviate that NS. And notice sticky is a string. That'll make the line stretch from top to bottom. And the horizontal spacing between the line and the other widgets will be five pixels. Notice that lines do not have a frame or a frame title, but they do have a tag. Again, in TK Enter Toy, everything has a tag. So well, here's our new Make GUI, and if you haven't been keeping up with the code, here's your chance to make your changes. You can see it's a little more complex than our old Make GUI, but the changes are fairly easy to follow. But you will see that the user will actually have a much nicer GUI to work with with these minor changes we made. There's one minor tweak we can make to improve our application, and that's improving the appearance of final and total. Now we know that final is a dollar amount, and total is a percentage. And since both of these are strings, it's very easy to add the symbol for dollars and for percentages. And we're going to do that now. To combine strings, one uses the plus operator. Whenever you combine strings, this is called concatenating. Notice the plus symbol has two different meanings. For numbers, it is the addition operator, and for strings, it's the concatenation operator. When an operator can change meaning based on the objects it's working with, that is said to be overloaded. The ability to overload operators is a very important feature in Python and very useful. One caution, you cannot mix numbers and strings with a plus operator. So let's look at an example now. Here we have two integers, a equals 1, b equals 2, and if we apply the plus operator, we get what we expect. Addition. Now we have a new variable. C is a dollar symbol. D is the string 3995. And we apply the plus symbol to those two, and we get a string with the dollar sign in the proper location. And this is what we're going to use. Notice if I combine the dollar sign with the integer one, that is an error. So here are the two minor changes you have to make in process OK to get this to work. All you have to do in the GUI set line for final is just add the string dollar sign and the plus operator to the front of the string final. And for total, you add it to the end of the string total. Again, the plus operator and then the percentage string. So here is the final version of our new application. And if yours doesn't look like this, this is a good time to fix things. Again, if you haven't removed those initialization lines for double discount, um, 
they won't hurt anything, but they're completely unnecessary, so you might as well delete them. And don't forget, at the very bottom of the code, you must call main. And here's our final test, and you can see that we have the dollar sign and the percentage sign where they need to be. And here is what the Android version looks like. Notice it is very similar to the Windows version. This is a nice feature of PK Enter Toy. You don't have to worry about the operating system. It will pretty much produce the type of application you want no matter where it runs. I can't stress this enough. The way we wrote our code, it was very easy for us to change the appearance of the GUI because we only had to change the make GUI function. Again, this is called modular coding. And the secret to it is you try to write the functions so they're independent of the other functions except for the input and the output that they share. And this should be limited to the least amount of information as possible. It's called information hiding. Now there's even a better way of coding for doing GUI type work. It's called object oriented, but that is far beyond the scope of this slide series. We will tackle that in a future slide series. Another thing we've been kind of ignoring is errors. If our user types in incorrect information, he won't see any error messages. The application won't crash, but nothing will happen. And we need to trap that better, and we will tackle that problem again in a future slide series. Mission accomplished. While it would be a stretch to say that you are a expert Python programmer at this point in time, you did write a GUI application, and hopefully it didn't take you much more than two hours. Now this is just a start into a new wonderful world of Python programming. And there are plenty of sources online to further your education, some free and some not. Python itself, when you installed it, included a tutorial. And uh, I highly recommend going through that tutorial. There are also numerous books, if you're a more of a traditional learner, that you can buy to guide you. Now the next slide tutorial in this series of Programming on Purpose will be an application that calculates the NFL passer ratings. And we're going to use this to learn a lot more Python. Until then, good luck and may the source code be with you. You can use TK Intertoy for a lot more things than just this project. And it is hosted at the above website. PyPy is the official repository for almost all free Python libraries. If you need something, odds are it's already up at PyPy. The documentation for TK Intertoy can be found at the site of Read the Docs. However, in both cases, it might just be easier. Just Google TK Intertoy and you can get to the links that way. If you live in or near southern Indiana or Louisville, Kentucky, I teach two hour free seminars at both the Jeffersonville and the New Albany Public Libraries. So all you need to do is just call or go online to reserve your spot. Thank you for your time, and if you enjoyed this slide series, be sure to subscribe. And if you have some friends that uh, want to learn about Python, be sure you tell them. Until next time.